just finished the Foothill Parkway widening project from Tamaris Lane to Teddy Bear Lane. I mention this all this list because all the construction activity seems to be done now, but the work's not done yet. We still have a lot of work to do on the connectivity of those traffic signals. Um, traffic patterns are changing still. In fact, we just awarded our, a contract to update our city master plan. One of the components on that is our citywide traffic analysis. We're still making adjustments to so all this work that just completed. The signals still are not synchronized. They're not talking to each other yet. Traffic patterns still have not adjusted. Things are still changing as people get used to the 91 freeway adjustments. The new corridors has changed. It's been such a radical change that our traffic analysis is necessary because it doesn't model anything we've ever done before. And this is going to be going on all the way through the rest of this year. So as you think traffic patterns are getting better, it's still a work in progress. And so we're going to get these signals synchronized. We're going to coordinate it together so we know what's going on. But it's going to take almost the entire year to make all that happen. So that's the job that's done. But we have some big projects coming up, too, that's going to affect traffic circulation as well. Big one we're going to start soon is the Corona Storm Drain Line 52. That's on Joy Street. That's from Grand all the way down to the channel, just by Park Ridge. Anything in that, in that corridor is going to be affected by that. It's a 54-inch storm drain, and it's going to affect that entire street and people trying to get through that area. And that's going to go on for almost a year. Then we have the Home Gardens Well Collection Line. This is a really long water line. It goes all the way from 3rd Street by Grand. It's going to cross Grand, continue down 3rd Street to Quarry Street, El Sobrante Road to 6th Street, down all the way to Magnolia, past the city limits, into Grand. That's going to go on for another year. So that whole corridor is going to be affected by that. Then we have the Ontario Cold and Place Recycling Product. This is a major corridor for the street, for our streets too. This particular product though is really nice because you'll be able to do the construction with minimum disruption to traffic. So although this is a major corridor, this big project will get done and it really will not have the effect on traffic because we'll be able to keep traffic on it while we're doing the construction itself. And the nice thing about this particular product is there's a train that goes by, it, it pulverizes the pavement, you can almost drive on it immediately after the train passes. So it's going to be very minimal disruption. Then the big project we've got coming out right now, in fact, we hope to advertise this next week, is the Calico Interchange Project. We've been talking about that for a while. That's actually going to happen now. We're waiting for approval from Caltrans to advertise. As soon as we get that uh, approval, we'll put that on the street, and I said as soon as next week. That project is scheduled to be awarded by in June of this year. Construction should start in late September, 1st of October. It should take about two years to complete. Also this year, we're going to be doing various sidewalks for the city. So you'll see a lot of activity throughout the city, modifying our sidewalks, updating the sidewalks, uh, fixing them everywhere. And it's going to take about three or four different products to make all that happen. I mentioned the new improvements we made along Foothill. And it said it's still a work in progress. One of the changes you're going to see this year is a new traffic signal at Green River and Montana Ranch Road. It said that whole corridor is still adjusting to traffic circulation through there. And as we try to modify our signals to set the timing so you can actually catch a green light from one point to the next point. If you go the speed limit, you'll be able to catch green lights pretty much through the whole corridor. But that's going to take, again, the rest of this year to make that happen because traffic's still adjusting. And then there's another one we're going to be thinking about is this restriping of 6th Street between Grand, East Grand, and West Grand. 6th Street is going to be restriped to one lane each direction. That's part of the analysis we're going to be doing for our citywide traffic master plan. You see how that's going to pack traffic and how traffic is going to be diverted around that. And there's one thing I want to talk about is SB1 is a big deal. You probably know about that one. It's going to affect all of us. This is Senate Bill 1 that is a new gas tax. And it's going to generate revenue for all the roads throughout California. For the city of Corona, for next fiscal year, we're going to get about $1.6 million additional money that we didn't have before. But more importantly, we're going to get about $3.7 million every year thereafter. This is a big deal for the maintenance of our ongoing roads and bridges and traffic signals. So we had a five-year master plan for what we're going to be paving for next year. This is a game changer. It's going to change the way we're going to maintain our streets. And I have to modify that whole structure because now we'll be able to do the, what we really want to do. Before, we were just trying to maintain them and keep them in a good condition, so that meant a lot of slurry work. Now we can actually go out there and do a lot of reconstruction and really fix the street properly. And another big product, thanks primarily to Senator Roth, is SB 132. That project alone is going to allocate over $84 million to McKinley grade separation project. This is a big deal. This project has been on, the, on our thoughts for a long time, but without this money, it probably wouldn't happen for 10, 15, 20 years. 
But this money's coming, and it's going to come with some strings. And that string is we have to complete the project by June of 2023. So you can see we got a lot of work coming down the road, and it's going to be still a busy, busy time for Corona. But all this is to help for circulation throughout the city of Corona. That's my update. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson. We're going <clears> to... <throat> We're going to go to you, Mike, but before that, I want to introduce both of you one more time. Nelson Nelson is with City of Corona, and he's the Director of Public Works and uh, ADA Coordinator. And Mike uh, Carmen, Mike Cram Craman, I'm sorry, uh, is the Chief Executive Officer of Transportation Corridor Agencies. Well, good morning, Corona. It's really wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, for inviting us and give us an opportunity to uh, update you on some of the things that are going on with the transportation corridor agencies. First of all, congratulations to Corona on making it through the uh, construction of the 91 project and thank you from the region for being on the front lines of what's an extremely important project to all of us and really will help improve mobility in all of Southern California. So, at the transportation corridor agencies, we run the uh, toll road network in Orange County, and you, you can see it here, the 241, the 261, the 133, and the 73 toll roads. Uh, that's 51 miles open. One of the interesting facts is that represents over 20% of really the controlled access highway network in Orange County. So one out of every five freeway miles in Orange County uh, is a toll road. Uh, we have 300,000 customers a day that use our roads and we generate uh, just over $330 million a year to help pay off the debt that we incurred uh, to build those roads. Uh, one of the great things about this system is our system was built parallel to the existing congested freeways like the 51, the 405, and the 5, which gives people a choice to uh, pay a toll, use our roads, maybe get to their destination a little quicker, a little more predictably, uh, but also they have the choice to use the congested freeways if that's their choice as well. And everybody benefits because the people that choose to use the roads takes traffic off of those congested freeways. Some of the things that we have going on, and we'll touch on that a little bit today, is uh, a project to develop the 241 uh, to 91 direct connector, which uh, I have a slide that will show you more detail on that. The 241 wildlife fence, this is a fence that's both for the safety of the wildlife but also for the safety of the drivers on our roads. And then the 241 connection to I-5, which is the segment that will uh, complete our network down in South Orange County. So the 241-91 express connector uh, is really going to be for people uh, northbound on the 241 are going to be able to access eastbound in the 91 express lanes directly and then for the people westbound in the 91 express lanes they'll be able to connect directly in the 241. Now with the new project that's in place uh, that will be extremely important because now the way it's set up people using the connector to get to the 91, 91 east are going to have to weave across five lanes of traffic to get in to the RCTC's new express lanes and so that'll uh, obviously create a little bit of, it's a difficult move, uh, particularly in rush hour traffic, and, and that will create its own sort of ripple effect in the traffic. So if we're able to provide this movement where people can get directly into the 91 express lanes, that's going to help uh, provide access there as well as improving flow on the 91 general purpose lanes. It's also going to help us relieve and, and help the situation of the backup that we have coming down Windy Ridge on uh, during the p.m. rush hour and the way we get the backup because quite, quite frankly with the capacity on our roads there's not enough capacity on the 91 to accept all of that traffic. So this project we're really excited about and is going to help that. We're uh, in the final phases of our environmental uh, review for that and we're looking towards starting construction uh, the end of 2018 on that project. At the other end of our system down south, you know, we're, we're, we've taken a kind of a step back and a relook at the project to connect the 241 to I-5 at the south end of the system. So we've gone through a very rigorous outreach and stakeholder group, uh, including out, outreach to the environmental opponents to that project. We've made great progress on that, and in November, our board approved a settlement agreement 
with the environmental groups, including Surfrider, NRDC, Endangered Habitat League, and, and 12 other groups, including the Attorney General, Native American Heritage Commission, and the State Parks Commission. So that really resets the table for us, and we're really excited about moving forward on that project. Uh, that project will go through a complete environmental process, which will take us about five years as, as we look at the ideas that we're getting from the community and the stakeholders in terms of how to complete this really important project. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dean. Great, thank you, Mike. I know uh, our audience has some questions today, but uh, we've received questions um, ahead of this uh, uh, session, and I would like to uh, I would like to ask these from both of you. I know some of these apply to RCTC and Cal or Caltrans, uh, so we know that. But uh, I'd like to ask you, anyways, those questions. Question one is um, Nelson. I think this will go to you. Uh, is signage? Why is signage for closed freeway ramps not placed better so drivers can make detour decisions before passing the closed ramp and having to go miles past where they want it or potentially getting stuck in traffic due to upcoming lane closures? Actually, that question would be more appropriate for Caltrans and maybe RCTC, it depends if they're uh, working on the 91 free right now. Um, I know Caltrans has policies and standards for how they're supposed to be posted. Uh, we do work with the city of, uh, of I mean, so RC, RCTC and Caltrans on advanced closures, but uh, I know recently we had one question about Cahalco right down here. There were some signs posted up there, and we followed up with Caltrans, and it was some routine maintenance. Routine maintenance, they don't necessarily tell us in advance when they're doing that, and they just uh, put the signs up there as they think they need to be warranted, though. Question number two is uh, probably Mike or Nelson, either one of you can answer, is another question is... Um, in regards to the carpool lanes, uh, which have been removed in favor of toll roads, if the carpool would, and if the carpool would be retain, returning, since it was paid for with tax dollars. Well, that's definitely a, a question for RCTC and OCTA, as they they are the ones delivering those projects. But essentially. The uh, Federal Highway Administration, in terms of degradation of traffic in the existing carpool system, as they become more crowded and expansion is needed, and there's uh, not really funds to pay for those HOV lane expansions uh, with federal or state dollars. So what those projects end up being is a managed lane or an express lane project in the conversion of the existing HOV lane, but with the addition of capacity in the form of a second lane and a managed lane. There's also then some pricing considerations for uh, HOV lanes during off-peak hours in terms of their use of those and things like that. But the reality is, is the capacity of those lanes were becoming so congested that they weren't really able to function in, as HOV lanes anymore. We'll probably see a move towards a three plus across the board in terms of the occupancy requirements in these lanes in order to allow them. But I think the way the state is taking the look at that, that where we need to uh, add capacity and go to HOV lane three plus, that there would also be the investment in the addition of, an, of another lane for more capacity and that would be paid for through the toll revenue from the, that system, that express lane system. Mike, I think the next question is going to go to you too. Uh, it's, uh, what is the plan for charges exiting and entering the 241 and the at the 91? The 91 express lanes published planned rates nearly a year before they opened, but changed that, those rates less than a week later. Okay, so there's, there's two questions there. So the first part of that, the 241 at the 91, so the connectors that we currently have there, the toll is paid up at Windy Ridge for those. Uh, when we do our connector project where you can go directly from the 241 in and out of the 91 express lanes, that movement will be dynamically priced, so it'll be 
fully dynamically priced where based on the traffic in the express lanes, in the general purpose lanes, and the demand for the connector, that price will rise and fall with congestion. So it'll be congestion price uh, in order to manage the number of cars that actually then get admitted to the 91 express lane so that we don't have any impact on those operations. So it will you know, vary with time and there won't be a set schedule for that. As far as the question on the 91 express lanes, again, that would be more correctly addressed to RCTC, but essentially they're in their six month wrap up, ramp up period to see what the demand is for those lanes, how traffic behaves, uh, where are their congestion points and, and how is the overall system operating. And during that phase, uh, they had sort of built into that continuous look at traffic and adjustment of rates to sort of calibrate the system. So that's why just a week in there was a change and you'll probably see uh, a number of chains, changes in the toll rate structure as we get through this first six months and then their regular processes for monitoring, evaluating and adjusting toll rates will be in place after that. Thank you, Mike. Um, this may be another one for RCTC, but perhaps, Nelson, uh, you may have uh, some insights on this. After seeing the community outcry and response on the 91 project, is there a plan to actively engage the community with the 15 uh, freeway project? Uh, yes, it probably will not be as extensive as it was for the 91 freeway. The 15 freeway expansion project is going to have almost all the work going down the middle of the corridor will have almost minimal effect directly on the city of Corona. Uh, so it won't have the same impact as 91 did. 91 actually had traffic diverted onto our local streets. It closed several of our ramps. It had an immediate direct impact to the citizens of Corona and, and all the commuters trying to get through there. The 15 is going to be much different. Almost all the work down the middle of it, minimal disruptions, but there will be opportunities to work with the community and the city as the construction starts, yes. Now, while you talked about the 15, um, the bridge here, the Cahalco Bridge, will, will the existing bridge stay uh, while the new bridge is being built? Will, be, will it be demolished? What's the plan for traffic there? Actually, uh, it will stay in place. Uh, this bridge is going to be a parallel bridge built next to it. It's going to be to the north side of this. Uh, in fact, I have a really neat, interesting video that I'm going to try to get posted on our website. It takes about four minutes to watch the whole phasing of how this proposal is supposed to be uh, constructed. Uh, it's going to take, as I said, about two years once construction starts. It will allow traffic to be diverted to one side while construction is going on. There may be occasional uh, diversions as new ramps are completed and they move everybody onto that. But uh, yeah, the new bridge will be built first and then when it's complete and all connected, and then it will take down the existing bridge. Thank you, Nelson. Another question for you, Mike. And this might also be an RCTC uh, question, but we'll try. What is the financial viability of the toll roads? Okay. Well, no, that, that would be our question. Oh, okay. I can talk to you about the financial viability of our system. So we've been in operation for 20 years now, and certainly there were the initial traffic projections and the development plans uh, around our system, and uh, there, were, there were periods of struggle, I would say, through that first 20 years in terms of our uh, number of customers, our traffic, our revenue. What we did about three years ago is we refinanced our debt and restructured our debt to take advantage of the historically low interest rates at that time. And as, as we're starting to see interest rates rise now, we're pretty happy that we did it then. What this has done is this took, you know, basically all of what we had learned through the experience of operating the system and were able to put in place a debt structure that really uh, matched the performance of the road and, and then was really based on uh, the growth of our debt, escalation of the growth of our debt, really at a much lower rate, really at or below inflation. So particularly now with the new structure in place and since we've come out of the Great Recession, uh, the activity on our roads is you know, inversely proportional to unemployment. The lower unemployment is, the better our roads are performing. So the past four years, we've seen greater than 10% growth, both in transactions as well as revenue. So we have a solid foundation uh, in our finances now uh, for, 
for the uh, foreseeable future. We have a lot of uh, buildup of our reserves so that other economic factors that could come into play in future years will be able to weather those. And we have uh, good headroom for the completion of our capital program as well. So we're on very solid financial uh, grounds now. That hasn't been always the case through our history and we're glad that we've been able to work through and put that in place so that we can continue uh, to provide the improvements we need to do to maintain and improve mobility in the region. Thank you, Mike. Nelson, I have a tough question for you here. It seems like as the freeway is being expanded, we're, uh, we're also building apartments and houses all over the freeway, all over town. And so the question is, what is the city uh, going to do uh, to accommodate the growing population with all the new multi- and single-family residences being built? Actually, that's something I talked about earlier was the update to our city general plan. Uh, all the construction that's anticipated is actually part of our city's master plan. We have vacant property located all through the city, and it was always intent to allow it to be built out. Our infrastructure has been designed to accommodate that. Uh, so we knew that these properties were going to be built out eventually. We knew our roads would have to accommodate all that traffic, and that's one reason we built that infrastructure, including the signals out there. Uh, so all the future development we're looking down the road at, we do know it's going to happen. This update to our general plan is going to be tweaked as we zero in on exactly what's left to be built out. We take a look at our existing infrastructure and its condition and what changes and modifications has to be made to accommodate all that future development as well. So all that's going to be evaluated this year with our general plan update and we'll provide uh, to the city council our plan to modify our infrastructure over the next 20 years. Thank you, Nelson. Mike, going back to you, what is uh, TCA doing to address the, the backup on the northbound 241 to eastbound 91 transition during afternoon and evening rush hours? No, uh, it, it's, it is probably the thing we hear, two things we hear from our customers is like, when are we going to do something about the backup and then when are you going to finish the road down south? So those are the things we hear. But we, we've got both a short term and a long term look at, at, at solving that. So uh, clearly the project that I showed you for the 241-91 connector that'll give an additional movement from the 241 to the 91 will, will help relieve that. Also we're depending on RCTC and its future ultimate project on the 91 that would, would continue. And, and I know that's a number of years away, but that would also help that because the root of the problem is the lack of capacity on the 91 to accept the additional uh, traffic from our road. In, in the short term, what we've done is we've added additional signage, additional striping, additional reflectors and things like that. And part of that is just to help reduce the irritation of the queue jumpers, you know, that come up in the fast lanes and then jump back over into the lanes that are backed up. We're, we've also uh, increased the amount that we're uh, paying to CHP to help enforce the queue jumping. Crossing the solid white line is against the law once you pass a, regular, a black and white regulatory sign that says the two right lanes are for the 91 east and the two left lanes are for the 91 west. So we're working with CHP to do that. Uh, certainly since the construction is done and the new lanes are open, we've seen a reduction in that backup, uh, but it's still there and it's something that is certainly uh, at the forefront of our minds in improving the experience of people using our roads.